So thank you for coming out once again. Uh, uh, my name is Miguel Hernandez. I have uh, organized user groups. I've been a co-organizer here at Drupal Camp a few times, doing very little compared to the rest. Um, I've organized hackathons and I've done quite a bit. That's over the last five years. I've contributed to um, various open source projects for about 10 years. And I'm big on community and sharing knowledge and diversity in tech and all that beautiful stuff. Uh, I, found, I founded the downtown LA Drupal group. Uh, it, it, it was just uh, a need that I saw that I was like, oh, not everybody's going to be able to go to the west side. Let's, let's make it more, it's about accessibility, right? Like, make it more accessible for people to come out. And I am no longer doing that. I stepped down so that I could start a Spanish-speaking open source user group in Los Angeles because it doesn't exist. So why not do that? Uh, LA is over 55%, 54, 55% Spanish speakers. So I go to all these great tech talks and I'm like, but nobody's talking to the native Spanish speakers in their own language. And, and it's just, I'm just going to hopefully just share open source software with them and go from there and just grow the open source community because I have a lot of love for open source. And I'm the founder at the Open Minds Group. We are a, a boutique development shop, engineering firm. <coughs> and we run on a pretty unique model. It's a 50-50 model, what I, what I call a 50-50 model, where 50% of the time I dedicate to clients and keeping trying to keep the lights on. And the other 50% of the time I give back to community. So that's user groups and mentoring youth and bringing technology to places that have been underserved for a long time. I grew up in South Central LA. I moved back there three years ago. And I'm big on, um, a lot of people say technology is the great equalizer. And I'm a firm believer that access to technology is the great equalizer. So if more people have access, the better all our products will become. So more women in tech, more diversity in tech. <coughs> oh, <Woo! sorry. laughs> Hey, it's only the humane thing to do. I don't need a clap for that. <laughs> so in terms of making it very, very simple, so there's a lot of terms that get kicked around the internet, you know, web app, mobile app, um, native app. So what is a web app? A uh, web app is, in terms of mobile, this is anything that is viewed via browser, so you have to launch a browser to actually view it. Uh, the benefit for, for creating a mobile, uh, a, I'm sorry, a, a web app is, um, is platform agnostic. So anyone and everyone who runs any type of uh, mobile platform is able to see your website and see your beautiful work and everything you've done. <clears throat> and uh, compare that to what is a native app. A native app is also, con is also known as a mobile app. That is something that is platform specific. Uh, the main benefit of that, oh, so platform specific, this is an app that's built for a specific platform like Android, iOS, you know all the rest, I'm sure. Uh, the biggest benefit is that it's usually optimized to run on a specific platform, therefore it translates to better performance, usually, if people do their job right. Uh, the other benefit is the ability to tap into device-specific features like push notifications and things like that, obviously, that are, again, device-specific or just mobile device in general specific. And so mobile platforms, everyone knows about Android, everyone knows about iOS, Blackberry, I think people still know about that. Windows Phone, I would say the same. Um, on the horizon though, and something to keep, in, keep on the lookout in case you're interested in mobile, is the, is the Tizen platform. It's a fully open, it's IBM's fully it's not really IBM's, it's Samsung and IBM's fully open source platform there. It's, it's actually, Tizen is actually really great. I went to a hackathon last December in, on, in West LA, in Santa Monica. And what's great about it is that if you have an HTML site, HTML5, there's very little things that you have to do to actually turn that into a, uh, into a Tizen app. So you can monetize that right away. They, uh, Tizen is actually really big in the automotive industry or they're trying to be really big in the automotive industry. So if you're looking at like connected cars and those types of things, that's, you probably want to look at Tizen since it's such a short barrier to entry. Um, on that topic, I was supposed to be in Vegas this weekend at the Connected Car Expo, but 
I, w I was also accepted to get spoke to speak here at Drupal Camp, and I said, "Hey, man, I'd rather be at Drupal Camp. That's where all the cool kids are." Uh, yeah, that's you guys, by the way, not me. Uh, the other one is the Ubuntu Touch OS, made by Ubuntu. Um, they've had some setbacks in terms of when they wanted to launch, but very, 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 very powerful uh, platform. In case you're interested, definitely, definitely, definitely look into that. And they have a, you know, it being Ubuntu and big open source, they have a huge um, uh, support system in case you're new, or in, in, in the Ubuntu folks are very, very uh, warm and welcoming, so no matter how much of a newbie or how much of an expert you are, they're usually very, very accommodating and, you know, ask any question on the, on the list and they're very happy to kind of get back to you. And if you're interested in more things like that, um, there was a talk that was given this year at scale. I definitely suggest all of you who are into tech to, to attend the Southern California Linux Expo. I don't know how many of you know about that. It is the world's largest volunteer-run open source conference in the world. I think I said that twice. Um, uh, last year they had about 3,000 attendees. I don't know exactly what the numbers were this year. They were expecting about 3,500. It's very affordable. It's like $60, $70 for the full ticket. And um, they, use, they give out so many like discount codes to local open source user groups. So, e so if you're ever, so for 30 to, 40, 30 to $35, you get three days of great, great sessions, top, top, top notch speakers. And actually this year, I was speaking to the organizer, one of the organizers for scale, Mati, and he was telling me that this year they're gonna expand it to four days. And I don't think they're gonna increase the price too much. So again, uh, I write for Linux Journal, so one of the things I always write about when I, when I try to pump up how awesome scale is, is that even if you were to pay the full price at scale, 60, 70 bucks, you get that money back in swag. swag. So think about that. So, and obviously, the discount. Yes, Steve. So um, are these gonna just like replace the Android device with like Pizen or Ubuntu Touch? I, I wouldn't say they're replacements, they're just different platforms like Android or iOS. They're not coming out with phone. Oh, Tizen's, they were going to launch a phone. I don't know if they already did it, but they're tied in very big with, I, with IBM and Samsung. So it's like, it's going to be a Samsung phone. I think they were deploying it first in Europe, Russia, Asia. I forgot where. It was somewhere back east, at least in part of the world. That, that's a huge part of the world. I'm sorry, exactly. But not to know where that is. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, anywhere back east. That's, and being in California, that could be in the U.S. as well. Um, so yeah, Tizen, I, I think is really, like I said, if you have an HTML5 app, definitely look into Tizen. It's very, like literally it could take you like an hour to transform your HTML5 app into a Tizen app. And one of the things that's, I'm going totally off script here, but one of the things that's interesting is that back in the day when Android and iOS launched, though, I mean, how many people have, here have launched an app in any one of the app stores? Oh, really? I would have thought there was at least more than one person here. here to do, right on. Um, you said it was for beginners. It totally is, sir. <laughs> um, so one of the interesting things is that when Android for, well, when all of the more established platforms, right, the top four, Android, iOS, BlackBerry, and Windows Phone came out, uh, this is still more, hold on. This is still more the case for, this is more in terms of Android and iOS. Like any other uh, platform, when they're brand new, they are hungry, hungry, hungry for content. They need you guys and gals to create apps for them because obviously the bigger that market, that uh, app store is for them, the bigger they look, the better they look, the better they can kind of sell that to, you know, Mercedes Benz or whoever they're partnering with, right? So now if you were to try to launch an app into Android and iOS, it's extremely difficult just because there's, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think iOS is like hundreds of thousands and so is Android of apps. A lot of them are duplicates and very similar and stuff like that. So in the very beginning, if you mi what I'm getting at is that if you miss that, you know, uh, gold rush, right? In the very beginning, I would definitely say do not miss out on Tizen or, and Ubuntu Touch OS because they're in that boat now where they're very new, they need apps so they're very, so not, not only do they want apps, it's a lot easier for your app to get accepted, obviously, as opposed to the more established ones. 
but uh, more importantly, they're very, very, they will bend over backwards to try to help you transport your app or help you get started, whatever, just because they are so hungry for content. And I hope that makes sense. Um, and, that, and I just put that up there in terms of Ubuntu TouchOS and Tizen are poised to take market share from Android and iOS, just because from what I've seen and the little I've played with both of them, um, they're amazing platforms. And specifically, uh, Ubuntu TouchOS I've actually used. And it's amazing. It's like a complete different way. Like the UI is completely different from what we're used to in terms of iOS and Android. Just some of the things that they do, I could go on. I could, I could have made an Ubuntu TouchOS presentation and taken up the full time. It's that awesome. Like in terms of usability as a user. So it's going to be very different or somewhat different. But again, if you're interested in launching apps, definitely look into the ones that are on the horizon because they are very willing to help you get there. And who knows, maybe they'll point you to great resources or videos or they're willing to come out or have someone that's pretty high level probably walk you through some steps. I mean, that's like free support. That's pretty invaluable. Any questions on any of that so far? So let's talk about the mobile market share. So uh, this is thanks to uh, the top two bullet points Thanks to Paul Coleman, actually, he, he uh, grabbed me. He's like, oh, man, this, the, I think this, these statistics were really good in your presentation. I'm like, well, I'm redoing it anyway, so let's bring it on, you know? So thank you, Paul Coleman, for doing that. I appreciate that. So 86%, this was from an article uh, la this weekend, last week, this week, in the New York Times. 86% of mobile use is in apps. 86%. The other 14% is in the browser. Of that, 65% of mobile users download zero apps a month. And again, the source is the New York Times via Mr. Paul Coleman. So what that tells you is that user, uh, mobile users are very app heavy. So you probably want to kind of consider that in terms of if you're doing any de mobile deployment or any of those kind of things. They're, they're, but you know, it's, it's, it's such an interesting, I mean, we could go on and on and talk about just those two points in terms of how interesting that is. Uh, in terms of the, the, the bottom figures relate to total uh, mobile use. So that includes, so in terms of the iOS number, that includes um, the iPads and the iPhones, right? It's all uh, mobile devices. Just in July of 2014, Android surpassed iOS for the first time ever. So Android had had a huge market share in terms of, in terms of mobile phones for a long time. They dominate, they've been dominating that for a long time. But just uh, two months ago, did they surpass iOS? And that's kind of big because there are a lot of iPads out there, <laughs> right? iPad minis and all that great stuff. Uh, so Android owns 44.62% of the, of the mobile market share. That's total mobile market share. iOS is 44.19%. Imagine a percentage line there. Um, the Windows Phone is 2.49%. And then, uh, uh, amazingly, BlackBerry is not large enough to be counted because we're taking into account all the... Because uh, BlackBerry doesn't make any tablets, right? So that, although their numbers are higher, are, are, are uh, significant or not that great, not that significant, but still it'd be a blip if it was only mobile phones. When you consider com com uh, total uh, mobile platforms, I mean, mobile devices, it's not um, large enough to be counted, as is Ubuntu Touch OS and Tizen because they're just launching. And you see the source there. So what the heck is Drupal Gap? It's a, it's a module. It is also a development kit. There was supposed to be an image after this, but there isn't. So don't, don't wait. For, don't, do not wait for that. Sorry about that. <laughs> So it's both a module and they also created, uh, so the module's been around for a little longer. They created a uh, uh, development kit to make it easier for you to just kind of roll it all, all at once, all packaged together. The Drupal Gap module is the, connect, is, a, is the connection between mobile applications and Drupal websites. Uh, it, the Drupal Gap module depends, has the dependencies of the services module and the views data source module. And so what the services module does is that it basically just allows you, allows any, um, allows you to connect via REST, SOAP, and all that stuff that we won't get into. It's, it's beyond the scope of this talk, but it's, it's relevant, but it's a lot more advanced, I would say. 
um, the services module allows you to connect um, uh, mobile to your website. So let's say you want to, you know, capture logins on a mobile app, on an app, but you want it to be populated in the database of your mobile of your Drupal website, right? That's one of the simple examples of what it can do. It can do all kinds of things. So just imagine all the things that that kind of connection that goes that's synergistic and goes back and forth can do. <clears throat> so the Drupal Gap Dev Kit is an open source mobile application development kit for Drupal websites. It uses Drupal, obviously. Uh, PhoneGap, jQuery, mobile, and JDrupal. I'll go into a little bit of those coming up. Any questions so far? Yes. So I believe a lot of uh, mobile apps, you could be out of service area and the app is still gonna work fairly well. So setting aside things like Instagram or anything like that where obviously you're not gonna be able to get a feed refresh. Yeah. Are you saying that if you developed an app using Drupal, it's not really gonna work if, if it doesn't have its internet connection if they're out of the service area and they load that app, it's probably not gonna display very much because it's relying on to or a lot of the content anyway to be delivered from the, from the website? I, I would say yes and no because uh, the part that is your Drupal website would obviously uh, is, is, it would be totally, f I mean, your app would be fine, you'd be able to access that, but because you're dealing with the services module and you're going back and forth with that connection, it would need a connection to make that connection back to your Drupal site. That, that so basically question. the app would load, but maybe not all of the content would be available. Correct. But that's Correct. No different than any other app that has to rely on an external source for today. Well, certainly yeah. in case of something like Instagram or Tumblr or anything like that, yeah. Yeah, a constant connection or just a, a one-time connection, it's all, yeah. But I, I'm also thinking in terms of the reason I want, might want to make an app is it would be nice if it were actually entirely standalone, like didn't require. And then you would just have it pull all the data the first time. Yep, exactly what Steve said, yeah. You would just uh, have everything available and then load it and you'd be fine. There might still be some things that it needs to touch, but if you know you dig down deep enough and you kind of programmatically built that in, then you might be able to get around that. I'm not going to say you're 100 percent. You could 100 percent reach that, but chances are you could. Probably close enough. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Is, it any, is it any different from just how an app would work with external data? Is it no. The same thing? Exactly the same thing. Because it's using all the same services that any other app would uh, app would okay. use with any other REST and so and, you know, JSON and all that JSON. Paul, did you have a question? I was just going to state that you, you can set up SQL in your mobile device so that you can basically copy your database over there, and so the only thing you wouldn't get was any refreshes. Yeah, what, what so Paul... You basically get everything to work there, it just wouldn't be able to refresh any new content on your website. Exactly. So what Paul is basically saying is, is a little piggyback a little bit on what Steve mentions, point, Steve's point, which is that you want all your uh, assets and all your database stuff stored uh, locally in the app. But if there's any changes, then obviously the delta needs to happen for it to actually be refreshed and any new content. But if there's not anything that's really uh, necessarily that has to be displayed or there's no real mission critical type stuff, then you'd be yeah, fine. There wouldn't be then you'd be totally fine. Yeah. Correct. And you can run the update because it's services, right? Like you can run the update via cron and you know, like you can get pretty you, you can have a lot of fun with it, I think, if you really want to dig in. Uh, part two is, with the Drupal Gap mobile application development kit and API, there is an API built into the Drupal Gap dev kit, actually, so that, uh, so those of you familiar with Drupal, its APIs, it's, you're, you're, you'd be very familiar with it. Uh, developers can create custom multi-platform mobile applications that communicate with their Drupal websites, which is basically the same thing we've been kind of discussing here with the question that the gentleman had. And, some of the points that Steve and Paul made. So, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, Drupal Gap is built on, uses Drupal and a few other things, and we'll go by, we'll go into them one by one. Uh, phone Gap. So, how many people have heard of Phone Gap? Awesome. That, that's actually more than I expected, which is great. So, we, we have some balancing going on. So um, PhoneGap is a free and open source framework that allows you to create mobile apps using standardized web APIs for the platforms you care about. So you can base, for those of you that don't know what PhoneGap, PhoneGap is, you're able to basically develop in one place 
and then what PhoneGap kind of does is create a wrapper and you can push it to different markets. So you can create in one place and then push it out to the, and the Android store and the um, iOS store and stuff like that. Um, development, develop on one platform and push out your app to several marketplaces, which is what I just said. Yes, sir. Sorry, this is, this is like the 64 question that no. I'm trying to figure out. Yes. If, is there a difference between a native app that's built with your phone app and built just natively coded? Yes. Okay. So the question is, is there, a, is there a difference between a native app that's coded specifically for a platform versus a phone gap app that gets pushed out to a marketplace. There, there are small similarities, the way that PhoneGap works. And interestingly enough, I invited the, um, the LA PhoneGap organizers to come down just because I wanted them to be here. And they know, so if you're interested in PhoneGap, I definitely suggest that you look them up there. I, I forget where they meet, but they're up in Los Angeles. So, and if you're if you, uh, not too sure what, what, what that's about or whatever, I, I'm more than happy to afterwards, you know, uh, give you a contact info and for you guys to head out and check them out. Um, but there are, there are downsides to not. Yeah, well, because for it to do that, it needs to create a small wrapper. So there's a little bit of overhead, but it's not anything that your user's ever going to notice. So if, if that's what you're worried about, then it's totally fine. Okay, great. Yeah. Then why do all these companies not do that? <laughs> like, why is it from well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a less performing. It's not pretty what you're going to do. Like Facebook, it's Android app until like a year, year and a half ago. Was fun one. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. But Facebook's pretty demanding with the images, all the chat, everything, the notifications, everything's going on. And they came out all the things and they came on and moved to that. Right. As long as you have something that's less demanding than the Facebook app, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. You know, they're not playing games on it either. But maybe asterisks. Yeah, I mean, personally, if I was building uh, an app, anywhere close to the scope and size of Facebook, I would definitely probably not use PhoneGap. I, I don't, uh, not to say that that's anything bad, but as, you know, with something like uh, Facebook that has so many assets that, that requires that like constant notification and all those things that are constantly pinging servers and stuff like that. You that just from a functionality perspective, not a scale perspective. Cor correct. Like it's, it just creates, the, it just creates more overhead that you probably don't want. But I mean, if you don't have the resources to really pay someone or, or build a, an Android app and an iOS app, I mean, I see a lot of companies, then, then you might want to have to go that way. Um, it's always interesting to see how companies sometimes have really popular apps, but they only choose one platform. So I, I've always been curious about that because I'm like, why, why, I mean, iOS is great, but it, it doesn't have great market share. It has great usability and stuff. So I, I mean, I, I don't know, like everyone has their own uh, um, reasons or, or protocols, yeah, prejudices, that's the word I was trying to get at, in terms of what's best and which way to go and stuff like that. So j just like anything else, just like anything in Drupal, there is 10 ways to skin a cat and none of them are particularly wrong or particularly great. It just depends on your particular use case that might be, you might want to go one way or the other. Uh, PhoneGap is actually an Adobe product and Adobe actually open sourced that, so I don't know. Is it, is it called Cordova now? Uh, I think, isn't Cord... I think it's like a port called Cordova. Yeah, um, the, you have PhoneGap, you have Cordova. There's an enterprise version of PhoneGap, but just the free version of PhoneGap is totally usable, totally fine. Uh, the enterprise version has more features, has a lot more bells and whistles, but I know plenty of people who've used you know, PhoneGap Cordova, and it's totally fine. So the other thing that uh, DrupalCap is built on is jQuery Mobile. I'm, uh, I'm figuring that most people in the room know what jQuery Mobile is. Uh, anyone not know what jQuery Mobile is? It's okay to raise your hand. It's, no one's going to bite. Well, I think it's just the mobile extensions to jQuery. Exactly. Yeah, it's just a, it's just basically a library. So jQuery Mobile is just the HTML-based user interface system designed to make responsive websites and apps that are accessible on all smartphone, tablet, and desktop devices. It's just basically a great library for you to get, get a lot of functionality. Uh, the last piece that DrupalGap is built on is JDrupal. And uh, JDrupal is an open source JavaScript library for Drupal. It provides an asynchronous RESTful API to Drupal websites for JavaScript applications. So again, we're not going to go too much into REST or SOAP or you know, XPC or 
um, JSON. But that's one of the features, and it's actually pretty cool, I think. Uh, you can use JDrupal to is easily build HTML5 and JavaScript-based mobile applications and web applications for your Drupal site. So technically, you could not uh, use any of that, you know, not Drupal Gap and not, I mean, technically, you could just use JDrupal and build just an HTML5 and a JavaScript-based mobile app if you wanted to. It's pretty, yes? Uh, so if JDrupal provides a RESTful interface to Drupal, how is it different from, like, REST WS and services and all those other I don't think it is. I think, uh, uh, from my understanding of the way it works, it works alongside it. Oh, okay. I, I could be wrong on that, because I always, uh, always could be wrong on everything. Right? I'm a human being. Uh, but I'm sure someone will Google that right now and probably, you know, call me a liar. <laughs> and uh, some, some resources for you, there's as, uh, the main Drupal uh, Gap project is at drupaltogap.org. Um, yeah, there's phonegap.com. You have jQueryMobile.com. Uh, JDrupal is actually created by Easy Street 3, and they open sourced that, that uh, what they built. <coughs> and obviously Drupal.org. And then the actual Drupal Gap, I'm sorry, Drupal Gap um, uh, module is at Drupal.org slash project slash Drupal Gap. Uh, thank you very much. How many, uh, anyone have, uh, how many, uh, anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh. If you installed the uh, Drupal Gap um, module, yes. Could you, with just that module, actually produce a mobile app? If I mean, you knew you were doing it up in Drupal to treat the views or whatever else that you needed, you could, at some point, generate your. Absolutely, as I said in one of the other earlier slides, a um, uh, the Drupal Gap module. One of the dependencies is obviously on the services module, which we discussed. And also on the views data source module, so that's where that right. part that's would come in. Saying, I'm in my, I don't know. If this is even a, an efficient way to go about it. But let's say I, I, the, the app I wanted to develop was a really small subset of my website, mm. right? So I, I work for college. I want to do something for admissions, right? So, mm. so, so somebody could not. They only have a mobile device. They don't want to. Our spot site is responsive, but it's still a massive site. So it would be really cool if there was just something. They're really actually interested and they want to download this app and just get the basic information, right? Correct. I would, I'm thinking that for my workload, it would probably be best to start with a, 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 a fresh install of Drupal and just work on and use that as building a site meant to be output as a mobile site rather than using my, the, my Drupal installation that's running my massive website to try and add that module to there and I'll put an app from that. Correct. So you, you, can, you can definitely do that. You could also use your existing Drupal site and connect it uh, via the services module and just pick and choose what you want to connect with, right? So you can pick and choose from your Drupal website what populates into that app. So you can totally do that programmatically uh, via the back end and stuff like that. So you, again, the great thing, 10 different ways to skin a cat. You can do a fresh installation. That's probably, honestly, what I would do as well. Just to make it easier, probably, or if it's a, lear or if it's a learning process as well, that'd probably be great. And if you don't want to... Yeah, if you don't want to mess around with the live site or, and, and what have you. Uh, but again, you could totally install it and actually just pick and choose what pieces from your Drupal site populates into your mobile app. Right. So it, it gives you a lot of power and a lot of flexibility. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Yes, yes. Yes, Paul. Well, I remember I went to uh, Adobe Max a year ago. Mm. And at that time, to get a, a, an Android app, a phone app, you had to basically pay Adobe. And they have one of their subscription interfaces for them to kick that out. So that still was the name, or if they drop that down so you don't have to pay a, a, a fee to have that. I think this, this, kind of, this kind of ties into my question. Did you cover the difference between Chrome Gap and Cordova? I did not. Just because it's one of the pieces of it. But, uh, but if you want to uh, ask a question about the difference. Um, so the question is uh, in terms of pricing for Phone Gap. If I'm not mistaken, right. uh, uh, so the question is in terms of the pricing, right? There is an enterprise version of PhoneGap. Cordova is al uh, is also um, is the open. Wait, I get them confused. Is Cordova the open source? No. They're, they're both open source. They're both open source, but, but PhoneGap is owned by. Oh, I know. PhoneGap is owned by Adobe, and I'm sorry, I, I know what it is. Add tweaks to it. 
Right. So PhoneGap is owned by Adobe. Cordova is a fork of PhoneGap. Right. Right? Was it the opposite? No, I mean. Well, yeah. Yeah. I always get confused. That's how I need to go to more PhoneGap meetups. <laughs> um, but basically, just go with Cordova. Or yeah. Unless you want. Okay. Say, or, so Cordova is the way to get it without the. Paying a domain, but you also don't get support and stuff like that. Yeah, and if you're if you're gonna want to develop that um, deploy to various markets, you want you might want to pay for that. Like it's it's. Yeah, it's pretty clean. Yeah. Yes. Just, could you talk quickly about the workflow? Is it pretty much you you would build a, a web app of you know. In, uh, web-based app, test it on your phone, and then press the launch to, to make an actual native app button, or how does that work? That's pretty much it. All right, excellent. It's, it's <laughs> not, it's, the, the, the people that have done the, um, the TripleGap project are, are very mobile knowledgeable, and so they've tried to make it as easy as possible for you to kind of, uh, you know, lowest barrier of entry into that. Obviously, it's still pretty complicated because of, you know, REST and all these other things that are very, very complicated to deal with. And, you're dealing with security and you're dealing with a lot of, you know, touchy things. But they, they do a very good job of making it very easy for you. Yeah. Any, any, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your, your patience and for you guys coming out and sticking around on Sunday this late, you know, missing all the football games. Thank you.